Hey everybody, welcome to The Big Liberty Show. I have a special edition for you today as I bring you the talk I presented at the Progress SA event at the University of Cape Town. This event was entitled Young, Black and Conservative and essentially we're having that conversation. Can young South Africans, black South Africans in particular, be conservative or classically liberal? Uh, my other panelist is a very impressive young man, uh, Homoto Moshikaro, an academic, um, very, very, very accomplished. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this. As always, remember to please support the show. Uh, you can do this by becoming a friend of the IRR, uh, which is our crowdfunding campaign. Um, please consider supporting the show monthly with a small donation. Um, I average about 90 rand a month. Uh, but it goes a long way in allowing me to be able to get out to events like these um, and, of course, to provide you the content. Guys, without waffling on and on and on, um, please uh, enjoy the show. And, as always, like, share, and subscribe the show, to the show. And leave me a comment at the end. Let me know what you thought about the talk overall. Evening, everyone. Um, we're about to start. Uh, perhaps let me start with introductions. Uh, my name is Neom Kwane, and I am going to be the moderator tonight. Um, I'm involved with uh, Progress SA, and uh, I was formerly also registered at this institution, uh, University of Cape Town. Um, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping issues before we, I go into the introductions of our two panelists. Um, the first one being that... Um, so when, the, when you guys have questions, we're going to, I think you'll notice that you've been given cards. So you're going to be writing down your questions there, and we have two runners that are going to be assisting us this evening. Uh, Tammy, um, she's still outside, uh, she'll come in, and Scott will also be helping us in terms of gathering all your cards, because we just want to have a much more smooth process in terms of uh, questions being asked while uh, the, the conversation goes. Uh, another thing, we will not uh, be tolerating any form of disruptions. Uh, we in a very uh, open space where people can express themselves, but please express yourself in a way that respects other people, especially the two panelists who took their time to come and engage uh, with us. If there's any burning questions that you want to ask, please bring it to the attention of any of our runners, as I indicated, Scott is on this side, and Tammy will be on that side, I'm not sure if she's already there. Okay, she's there. okay. so our two panelists today, um, we have Cynthia Ngobeze, who is uh, the host of the show, The, the Big, uh, the big uh, Liberty, Liberty Show. show. <laughs> uh, and he is a very, I think he doesn't need any introduction. I mean, for those of us who watch his, watch his videos, we know that he's someone who sparks some controversial debates now and then. Uh, but he's also involved with the IRR, the Institute of uh, Race Relations, which does the liberal think tank, which does quite a lot of work. Um, uh, and yeah, it's really great to have you, CC, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Our second uh, panelist is uh, Homocho Mushikaro. Um, he is an academic. I just went through his CV, it's very long. <laughs> so, but yeah, he uh, uh, was involved, uh, studied at Oxford University, and um, he's. Uh, are you a lawyer? I think you're a lawyer. Yeah, he's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, very, very uh, talented people that are sitting right here, and I'm, I, I literally cannot wait just to pick their brain on some of the issues that we're going to be talking about. So uh, today's topic is young black uh, conservative, con conservative, and uh, the politics of identity and liberty in South Africa. So we just want to make sense of this and just unpack some of the issues, some of the, 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 the big debates that have been going around. And I'm sure that our two panelists will have some interesting uh, takes on the various themes that we're going to be covering today. Uh, perhaps I should start with you, Cesar, just a few minutes just to 
go into t today's topic and yeah, take it from there. Cool. Um, thank you very much for having me, guys. Thank you for coming out. Very strong numbers. Uh, you know, a far cry from uh, my days at university, where one struggled to even bring out ten people. That, that's with the promise of uh, nibbles at the end. Um, guys, thank you so much for coming out. Look, uh, this has been a topic which I've applied my mind quite deeply on it, insofar as it's... Um, it speaks to the battle of ideas that we're facing as a society today. And when I talk about the battle of ideas, of course I do talk about the fact that we live in a constitutional democracy with freedoms that are accorded to every single one of us. And these freedoms are founded by and large in a liberal tradition. However, society, the society we live in is, um, uh, let's call it diverse. Um, and in its diversity, there are different vested interest groupings. Uh, not all of whom believe in the very same liberal ideas that allow them, that give them the freedoms to ventilate their ideas freely in society. And I premise what I'm about to say um, on this because that's exactly what I mean when I talk about the battle of ideas, is that you know, we are at a point where um, ideas are, if you to believe the other side of this particular debate, we are, we're at a point in which ideas are linked and every attempt is made to tie them to identity and race. Uh, or excuse me, identity, including race and gender and any other creed which is determined by a certain grouping of people who have made themselves the arbiters of public discourse, have essentially enjoyed quite a lot of uh, media space, both in terms of traditional media and social media, and of course are filtering into all forms of society or, or institutions in society, including uh, politics and the state. But um, before I unpack any of this, let me just speak to a little bit as to who I am. Guys, my name is Tiki Ngobese, or really commonly known as Big Daddy Liberty. I'm the host of the newly launched Big Liberty Show, which you can find on social media. Um, and essentially, um, and, and also, sorry, I'm the head of strategic operations at the Institute of Race Relations. Now, who is the RR? Just very briefly, we are an advocacy organization that fights for your right to make decisions about your life, your family, your business, um, free from unnecessary government, political, and bureaucratic interference. That's essentially who we stand for. We are an actual classically liberal organization. And with that being said, if I had said this in other spaces that I've spoken at, which are a lot more hostile, the immediate response I would have received is, you are a coconut. The concept being, you know, being brown on the outside, white on the inside, or an Oreo, same concept, uh, house nigger, there's some of the other expressions that have been thrown my way, house negro, same concept, and Uncle Tom, that's a popular one, uh, you'll find that on my timeline. Um, I've been called a Kaffir by people who profess to be standing for black interests and black folks, believe it or not, and of course the more popular one which I've seen come through via anonymous accounts is I'm a rented black. Now, these are the, not counter arguments that come my way when I profess the ideas that I profess, but rather the slurs by a group of people who are dead set on uh, shutting down free exchange of ideas, free speech, and essentially ideas that challenge and oppose them, um, specifically their, their identitarian, as I like to call them, view on things. Um, again, if I have to go to my notes here, these are all terms that are used to try and malign people like me, people who think freely and people who think differently from the race and identity merchants who've come to dominate such spaces as universities, social media, and even traditional media. The thing, though, is that such a phenomenon is not necessarily new in this country. South Africa has always been a country that shuns and vilifies those who think differently, specifically those who advocate uh, for the individual and warn against groupthink and the obsession of identity. Uh, you know, race, gender, and any other form of creed. For far too long, South Africans have had to put up with, for example, governments, politicians, and elites, um, who tell them not only what to do and how to live, but also specifically who we are. We have, and continue to endure, a crooked coalition of different interest groups uh, within politics, the state, and within some pockets of civil society, the media, and academia, who drive ideas into society that seek to polarize and divide people. These divisions, of course, are often based on tribal lines, collectivist notions, and various nationalist ideas that have played themselves over since time immemorial in this country, whether you talk about colonial era, uh, the apartheid era, or even today with our current dispensation. 
the individual in South Africa, whether black or white, has always been under assault from one nationalist grouping or collectivist grouping or identity merchant or the other. These people are the sort of people who take pride in having a chosen grouping or a, an our people. And you hear this a lot from our politicians, the idea of this our people. And essentially, they favor this our people over other people. They pick winners and losers in society. They don't view people as individuals. They have no form of respect in that sense. And they hate the concept, in fact, of the individual. To them, people are defined by your identity, as I've said. Any sort of uh, uh, specified social or physical traits, such as race, gender, ethnicity, and even your income levels. We see this type of thinking playing out in our society daily, in our politics, uh, in our various institutions of society, and of course in academic spaces like this one. Different vested inter interest groupings who trade on identity and peddle dangerous ideas aimed at creating a toxic narrative of us and them. Now, these identitarians, who I said I refer to them in this regard, are deeply immersed in the rhetoric of division. Now, I could go into a long uh, explanation as to where they draw their ideological underpinnings <clears throat> and essentially out of their thought process from, you know, in terms of the postmodernist uh, type uh, uh, thinking. But I think just for the sake of a short introduction, I will then say I juxtapose myself, I, I stand in opposition to these identitarians by what I believe in. I'm a classical liberal, I believe in the individual, and I believe that the individual is. Uh, and really, when I talk about individual, really we're a family society, so often I intermingle the two ideas. But essentially, I do believe in the individual and the primacy of the individual. If I can just get to my notes. Um, in this respect, in this respect, it is this recognition that every individual owns themselves, or own, owns themselves, excuse me, and has personal agency. And over and above this, I then go to the point of what exactly is classical liberalism, right? So in short, it's a worldview and ideals that places the individual, um, or places the freedom of the individual, excuse me, uh, a person like you and me, at its, uh, cent as its central feature. Classical liberal liberals do differ. We, we're not a monolith, we're not homogenous. We do differ on many things, but there's essentially 10 key, key principles uh, to which we stand. <clears throat> as I said, I'll gloss through them for the sake of uh, time. Uh, number one, liberty as the primary political value. Um, we ask the question as classical liberals, does government action reduce or increase freedom? Um, and when we speak about government, we often speak about government in the context that it should only act to uh, prevent harm from others, to others. Number two is individualism, where the individual is more important than the collective. Uh, every individual matters, um, and in every individual is worthy of respect. Number three, is skepticism about power. Um, all classical liberals are very skeptical about power and those who wield it. Um, those in power often claim to force things on you, in, you know, for your own good, but really it's their own interest that they're serving. Thus, skepticism of power is a good thing, as, an ex as the exercise of force, um, rather the exercise of force against people and people's individual interests should always be discouraged um, as much as possible. Number four is the rule of law, the idea that there should be a legal uh, framework in which society is governed under, which checks powers and essentially limits the powers uh, or concentrated power, in particular power of the state. Number five, I know this is a very long list, there's only ten things, um, is civil society. Government is not the most efficient way of organizing things. You know, power should be devolved as far as much as possible to the family and as local possible as, as possible to the community level where I value, for instance, voluntary organizations, the family, the church, uh, social clubs, etc., cetera, um, as more efficient ways of organizing and um, achieving goals. Number six is spontaneous order. The idea that you don't need a centralized authority to tell you what to do. You don't need a centralized authority to govern your everyday interactions with people next to you. For instance, I speak in Zulu. Um, there is no one person or a centralized grouping that uh, you know, uh, 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 made Zulu, excuse me, or, or, or invented this Zulu. Zulu uh, developed through a spontaneous process over time, naturally, and through people voluntarily exchanging terms and terminology. And I'm arguing that essentially spontaneous order is how society should be organized. 
Number seven is free markets. Um, economic activity should be left to volunteer interactions between people who have property rights. Um, I think that's oh, yeah, self-explanatory, but I'll take questions on that later. That's usually the point of contention. <laughs> Number eight is toleration. The idea that you not interfere in things that you happen to disapprove of. Um, you know, you, you can't force your own opinion through you, the use of, let's say, state coercive uh, manipulative power um, on things you disapprove of. For, I mean, a good example is free speech. Um, the idea that everybody should be allowed and should have the freedom to say what they want to say, um, as long as the only limit I include is, you know, you're not, not directly inciting violence. Um, but yeah, uh, number nine, just to cross through these guys, is peace. So much more is achievable through holding a non-aggression principle to things. Um, you know, avoiding the use of force and violence as a means of achieving things. You know, we, we take peace for, for granted, uh, even, you know, even amongst us. I, I look at the sort of age, I'm assuming the age grouping in this, uh, in this room. A lot of us take peace for granted. And we look at South Africa's development and we don't realize just how much we dodged a really serious bullet, excuse the pun. Um, where it is very difficult for a lot of communities in this country, especially marginalized ones, to be able to achieve anything, um, let alone their own self-interest, because of a climate of violence that we came from. And I speak as someone who grew up in uh, Imlazi and was in Natal in particular, where we had, yeah, uh, we had the risk of slipping into some form of civil war where nothing would have been able to be achieved. Why? Because of warring factions. So peace is very important, and it's something classical liberals really strive for the avoiding of use of force and violence to achieve things. Um, and the last one, of course, number 10, without waffling on and on, is limited government. And I'll speak to this a little later, where I argue that government should only have three roles. One is to protect us from foreign aggression. Two is to protect us from internal threats, criminals, people who threaten life and liberty. And of course, the third is to arbitrate our disputes or to administer justice. So I really glossed over these things, but as a classical liberal, as a black liberal, and uh, this, these are the things that I stand for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> now I'm going to give an opportunity to Pomozo, and he'll provide us his take on today. Um, so I'll just have to change some of the things I was going to say, but. Never mind, in my um, determination to best end my career as soon as possible, I think I'll be a little bit more controversial than you are. Um, so I, I'll take it as my challenge to give a conceptual scheme about the different brands of conservatism because this is the title, um, and I understand classical liberals object to that label, so please don't necessarily include yourself in this. I want to run through these different sort of brands and strains, explain some of the value propositions that they make, um, and then I want to speak about their relationship to identity, specifically um, to, I suppose, a black identity, but also um, being gay, I guess I can also um, speak a little bit about sexual minorities um, and dissent in that respect, um, and I'll deal with counter-arguments about a particular construction um, I'd argue for, um, and then um, with responses to that counter-argument. Um, so, let's try to do that. Um, I'd say there are about four sort of strains of conservatism, or what we might call mainstream conservatism, um, and I'm going to do my best not to anchor it in a particular US or UK context, but a South African one. Um, and maybe some of these will seem familiar to you. So there are those people, and sorry, by every measure I speak of political conservatism, I don't necessarily collapse it in a haphazard way with other forms. So one, the first way we might call um, a brand of dispositional conservatives. Um, dispositional conservatism is something alike to the following proposition, that is, conserve things of value mainly if they exist, take care in how you wish to improve them, even when they are not utopian or satisfactory, right? Completely. Um, so what you'll notice about this particular brand of conservatism is that it doesn't make substantive claims. It's simply saying that um, your initial responses to something um, politically, whether it's a policy, a call for reform, um, in any context, um, 
you do your best to identify those things that have value and you conserve those first. And sometimes when you are faced with a choice, um, here I'm going to quote a Marxist analytical philosopher, Jerry Cohen. Um, sometimes when you're faced with a choice, the mere fact that those things exist is actually a reason to prefer them above a particular improved or utopian version of the thing that exists, right? Um, and that's because it actually is present. It is here. Um, and things usually come about, as you kind of hinted at, sometimes spontaneously, and so are not necessarily designed. A second brand of conservatism is kind of what you've touched on, um, CK, a little bit, um, which is a particular government skepticism. Um, and so this is what commonly is called a libertarian tradition, which is generally the proposition that government is designed for corrupt human beings who seek power. Generally, they usually use it to benefit themselves and not um, the groups that they claim to benefit. And so the best government, since you need a government, is a small government. Um, and you replace the overwhelming power of the state with voluntary organizations, market forces, um, family ties, etc. Right? Um, now, an important note that I'll just add about this particular tradition is its epistemic claims. Right? Um, the epistemic claims made here is that fundamentally, knowledge is distributed in society um, and it is best accessed um, rather than being centralized within a committee of 10, 20 or 300 people, best exercised as a practice day to day on an individual level. Best example of that is exactly what markets are, right? Um, for instance, a particular brand of economics would say that the best way to tell when what people actually value and at what price they prefer to pay is precisely by looking at their practices instead of setting ideal prices for them. Um, so that's the second brand. There's a third brand of conservatism, and I think this is probably the common brand that people associate when you hear it, and that's social conservatism, right? Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to do my best to try and represent um, th that in its best light. And that could be something like um, you prefer social ties and cohesion um, above necessary experimentation, generally. Um, and at the social level, at the very least, um, one would rather have decisions that are taken, um, I suppose, for what you would call the common good, but the common good not as defined by the state. Um, Best example would be, for instance, um, disagreements. I think I'll use an example about um, from, uh, in the sexual minority community. For instance, disagreements about the value of marriage and the institution of marriage. Um, there's been a long-standing debate um, in the gay community about generally whether or not um, marriage is a worthy institution. Many people claim it to be patriarchal, heteronormative on one end. Others believe, well, considering the kind of marginalization that gay people experience, or trans people, or any other gender identity, or sexual minority, etc., marriage might be one way of them forming new social ties after being rejected, obviously, by their initial families, etc. Um, in that instance, what you're seeing is that the emphasis on this idea of common good and social ties, right? And the obligations we owe to each other being put first so this might not be comfortable <laughs> or sit comfortably with a <laughs> classical liberal conception. Um, and the fourth kind um, of conservatism, I suppose you could maybe argue, is a particular kind of brand of nationalism. Um, and this will seem controversial in the South African context, um, I suppose, but we know various brands of what this would look like. And I'm, again, going to try to represent this um, in a non bastardized form. Um, and that might be something like um, a self-determination claim, right? Um, that um, at some level, um, we not only just emphasize social ties, common goods, social cohesion, but actually um, a particular group liberation as well, right? So it's the language of liberty as constructed for particular groups of people. Um, now it's important that 
you notice that it would still be the language of liberty, right? Um, it isn't necessarily the same as the language of equality. Here, I think a perfect example would be something like what used to be called queer liberation, right? On one end versus queer equality um, in a different end. The emphasis here are the values that are being pursued at the group level. But notionally, um, it might ring something like in response to some kind of marginalization, oppression, etc., you ought to organize in solidarity in order to liberate not only yourself, but those members of the particular group. Now, you'll notice that these forms of conservatism necessarily um, are at the most abstracted level. Um, but I think you can still get a sense of how they differ, um, what we mean when we use them in a particular context. But that's all very academic and boring. So let me rather get to some of the sexier stuff um, that will offend. Um, so now the, the primary question would be, what's the role of identity in relation to these political forms, right? Um, and one particular, I think, pragmatic approach to it is to understand that, you know, identity, whatever it may be, um, is the kind of thing that we are taught is a social identity. It's innately social, i.e. it is, I suppose, communal, right? It's about you are an X. Our social identities, be it race, gender, class, creed, religion, etc., will always make claims of us. So the proposition I'm making, maybe some of my former students are here, they'll recognize some of this stuff. Um, the proposition I'm making is not that you can ever not have claims made of you by your social identities. Of course you can, and it would make no sense <laughs> that you could exist in the world um, without that. Um, the further proposition is that ethical moral choice depends on what you choose to accept, the claims you choose to you accept um, from your identities, right? I'll give some examples. Um, one could argue that members of your identity group can claim that black people ought to have a particular economic um, belief or economic approach about how best to deal with the land question, right, um, in South Africa. Um, now, this is something that's not necessarily controversial because if we were to ask ourselves what are the issues affecting the black South Africans generally, land is a huge thing um, because of our history. Now, if a particular identity group argued that in order for you to be an acceptable black person or an acceptable member of our community, you must hold these specific economic ideas from the specific school of thought, you might want to be a little bit cautious about that because I, having been black for quite a while, um, <laughs> generally never got an economic policy handed to me at birth, right? Um, before I touched an economics textbook, I, I kind of was black um, and knew it. Um, so you would be skeptical about that, right? When it becomes a necessary condition for your identity membership um, to that group. And so the important question in ethics are about what particular claims you choose to recognize. For instance, I have an easy claim I will every day at any point at any time happily accept about my identity group, which is that I loathe white supremacy <laughs> generally as a thing. And I don't use it in the loose sense. I really do mean um, I actually hate a particular proposition that assumes because of the color of my skin I am inferior in my moral status in some way. Um, I've met many uh, white Indian or other people from other racial groups who are smarter, cleverer, prettier, you know, all of these things, but the claim I choose to stake myself on is my moral status, and that I have equal moral status, i.e. equal moral agency, right? Um, not equal opportunities, necessarily. As I said, I'm not as smart as some people, and I'm not as pretty as some people, and for various reasons, I'm not as wealthy as some people, um, as I notice every day as an academic. Um, <laughs> But regardless, um, that's an example of one kind of 
identity claim I'm very happy to accept, but there are several others I'm not willing to accept. Um, I certainly will not have my economic views dictated to me yeah. um, by an identity group, but I'm certainly not going to have my legal views, as my colleagues know as well, that if you condition my blackness about what legal philosophy I have, you're in for a very nasty surprise about what that means um, generally in terms of an acceptable response from me. Um, regardless, that's one example. Right? But I'm now going to deal with a counter-argument to this position of sort of an ethical framework of dealing with identity um, and conservatism. So you see how it fits with conservatism because I may be black and in certain instances socially conservative, right? Um, so let's say I may be big on, I don't know, family values or whatever it might be um, versus less libertarian. In fact, I'm quite socially not conservative um, on very many questions. Um, but regardless, one can be that, and on the other hand, easily one can also be very skeptical of governmental authority and belong to a libertarian tradition. Um, or be dispositionally conservative, right? And now, here's one example. In fact, as a lawyer, I think I am by nature dispositionally conservative. A legal system tends to attract people like that. This does not mean, by the way, I oppose legal reform. I always just require quite good reasons for why we upend the laws we have, generally, right? Um, that used to make you a good lawyer. I'm not so certain anymore, um, generally. So that's a slight. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's unwarranted, but regardless. Anyway, um, now, the counter-argument to this position would be this, and I think it's a very good one, it's a very strong one. We come from a history and a past where we can use black people, but I think it applies for you know, other identity groups, where if you belong to a minority group that was previously oppressed, you know very well that your previous oppressors easily divided groups, right? Um, and that there is good reason to prefer solidarity first before you decide your own ethical choices as you wish about which claims from your identity group you choose to accept, et cetera, et cetera, right? The stakes are just too high if we are going to effectively deal with some of the challenges we have as a result of our past, as a result of, for instance, land dispossession, right? You need to emphasize solidarity currently because it's a moment of crisis. Now, this may be all fine and well, at least a response to this would be, this may be fine and well, but the problem is actually that it's not just an emphasis on solidarity per se someone is making, but rather setting necessary conditions for your membership to the group, right? Mm -hmm. So when you call someone a coconut, you're actually saying something far more sinister than just simply you disagree with the way that they interpret blackness and how they express blackness or whatever it might be. You're saying something deeper, which is they are not really black, that they don't need certain necessary propositions to be members of a particular group. And the reason why that defeats the purpose of group liberation, or at least I think a sensible argument for it would be we start policing the boundaries of acceptable black thought um, we police the boundaries of acceptable gay thought. I've had that as well. Um, it sounds outrageous, but it is a thing. I would have thought being gay is just like by definition sometimes, you know, um, pretty evident. Um, <laughs> that like, huh, yeah, um, I'm a member of that group through my actions. Um, some of which I, I hope will never ever be recorded. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of some of like my pride. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, <laughs> The point would be that it hurts the group um, in the end or down the line if you set the disagreements you have with people about ideology, about moral claims, about what the problems and the priorities for that group are as necessary conditions for membership, right? Because inevitably, that will turn around on you, right? You are setting up in very many ways um, your own demise because there will come a time when you don't agree with a particular mainstream idea and you yourself will be excluded from that group using the arguments you are currently making, right? So it's a self-defeating kind of concern when you set these necessary criteria and these necessary conditions. And I think particularly in a South African context, 
that's likely the most pernicious form, right? Um, that we can think of when we think about identity and all of these dissenting groups within minority groups as you would have them. Um, yeah, and also, yes, a last point, sorry, which is um, that the other reason why it's probably not a good idea to do that is that actually solving complex problems requires, and I'll use both left-wing and right-wing discourse here. If I'm left-wing, it requires the dialectic, right? It requires opposing forces actually clashing and then forming a synthesis, i.e. something new that incorporates versions of the old. Um, a perfect example would be disagreement about land reform policy, right? Um, there are various different models of what property systems ought to look like. I can't now speak with confidence about what the best one is, and I don't really think anyone can up until we've had the debate, worked it out, and started implementing policies seriously, because I think we can all admit that it hasn't been taken seriously for a very long time, and then we can make a judge about what was the best kind of policy. But I guarantee that we will usually have a better result if we allow opposing forces to actually conflict and oppose each other and then work out a synthesis. So that's a Hegelian Marxist kind of argument. The other sort of liberal argument would be, you know, a heterodox institution where there is the marketplace of ideas, blah, 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 gets you a better solution, right? Um, these are still the same propositions. And I think it would be a very sad thing if black or queer or um, other identity groups weren't allowed the opportunity to also synthesize their core disagreements, right? Um, and work towards trying to solve the problems they face from within the group, but also from um, external forces outside. Um, and so that's the other reason why you wouldn't want to set necessary conditions for group membership, just simply being points about moral disagreements about what is owed to the group. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a start. Okay, guys. Uh, just a reminder, uh, you have been given cards to write down your questions. So if there are people with questions already, we can start uh, mobilizing them to one of our runners. Uh, Scott on this side and Tammy on the other. But there's, there's been some interesting points that uh, you, you guys raised. Uh, and um, both of you have been quite controversial. Um, but I just want to push you guys a, a little <laughs> bit more to see if we can't... Uh, I'm actually quite glad that none of the th chairs here can be thrown around. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just going to push you guys kind of quite a bit. So, see, you spoke of, of, of ideas being linked with identity. And, uh, this has been... Um, I, I remember one of... During the, the, the Fees Must Fall, Roots Must Fall movement, uh, this, there was this buzz around uh, collective identity and people being denied uh, uh, collective identity. Uh, it, is this what liberalism or classical liberalism seeks to do? Are we, are we trying to say that because the individual is so important that people cannot have an identity which is collectivized in, in, in one or any other form? Not at all. Um, I think what we're really saying is a, a good society is one where there is freedom for the individual to self-identify however they so please. And in the process of you self-identifying, there's a recognition that there are many and multiple things in society that influence who you are. Um, I'm a Zulu... Uh, uh, I'm Zulu, sorry, no, I huh, couldn't think of anything else there. Um, <laughs> it's still down, down thing. Um, but look, the point I'm trying to drive at is this. Um, in a free society, any individual should be able to self-identify as they please. Um, and that's what the freedom part allows for. It accords everybody that right. It accords, it accords everybody that ability so that you can be a, uh, a Zulu Jew um, and or a white... Uh, Zulu, um, as there have been cases in the past, um, a very famous singer um, who self-identified as Zulu. Um, you know, we 
society is free for that reason. You know, it, it gives the individual just that very ability to self-identify as they please, and nothing stops that individual from being essentially what they want to be, number one. Number two, nothing stops them from belonging to a group which happens to, you know, uh, you know Zulu's... Zulu speaking people, the Zulu people are a group, if you will. They, they, that is a strong identity that is shared by multiple people. The, the problem then comes when that same grouping argues that you can't be anything else because you've self identified as Zulu. Um, and then there's force used to prevent, to stop, to stifle um, free choice, to stifle uh, free exchange of ideas. Um, and I think that's the problem we face today, to be brutally honest. Um, is that, yes, you can have multiple things that influence who you are, who influence how you self-identify, um, but there are certain groupings, there are certain vested interests who then believe that because you've self-identified this way, that one, they are the arbiters of everything that is that, and that you can't um, introduce ideas, you can't challenge uh, things that you might find problematic or weird or different or... Um, morally questionable, but essentially there are certain people who have appropriated upon themselves to be the language and thought police, who then control and essentially decide what your identity should be. And the nefarious thing about them is that they are very good at then shutting down any debate or discussion that challenges them, either in one of two ways. Either A, they appropriate a victim status of their own, that essentially would make you a bad person, right, for questioning them. I mean, what kind of evil monster berates or questions a, a, a victim, you know, who, who does that? Um, um, so they, they, that's the one way in which they shield themselves from scrutiny, and the other is just by sheer intimidation, threats of violence and actual violence, um, where, again, why would you speak out? Why would you challenge people if you knew that there's the real risk of someone bringing harm onto you, essentially affecting your life and your very liberty? Um, those are the two things that I think we've seen develop, um, and the real risk then becomes, what sort of society do you then become? Do you become a society where people are actually quite honest? Um, because they have the means to freely express themselves, to speak to people. I mean, we're a country of 55 million people, 11 languages, multiple cultures. Free speech allows that sort of society to flourish because people are able to understand each other, talk to each other, and freely exchange ideas. The problem comes when you have those, again, those vested interest groups that I speak of, that actually argue, or believe, sorry, that they are the gatekeepers of any, anything and all things identity, that anything outside of this shouldn't exist, and they use either force or intimidation to stop that. But uh, surely, um one can make an argument that uh, uh, if you fall under a certain group, then these are the characteristics of this group, and if you hold a different opinion or value that is opposed to that group, then you shouldn't be part of that group. I mean, I'll make reference again to the to the student movements, where the a big a big phrase that was used was lived experiences. Like if you if you black and you had a, a much more uh, a better lifestyle or a better upbringing, you had an opportunity to access private schooling, then you don't understand the plight of the majority of black people who had to you know, take three taxis or walk 10 kilometers to go to school. You can't be part of that group, surely. Okay, so two things I think are going on there, and I'll do my best not to comment on mm. the student movement because I'm a lecturer, so, you know, be careful about that. Mm. Um, contrary to popular belief. Um, but, um, so, uh, characteristics, I think one has to be more specific about that, right? Um, yes, there are characteristics that every identity group must share. So. Racially, up until Rachel Dolezal, it used to be a certain amount of melanin to be black, I don't know anymore, but let's just accept that particular category, right, of what makes someone black. Um, it is certain features um, and certain characteristics. Um, being gay tends to be an attraction to someone of the same sex. Um, all right, those are characteristics, but I think far more fundamentally is that we are sort of edging towards beliefs and ideology, right? Um, and I'm not sure those are characteristics that necessarily are therefore unique to a particular group, right? Because that is moral normative criteria we attach there. Um, and I think that there are good reasons for us to treat characteristics um, or immutable characteristics in one way um, as whatever criteria for membership and beliefs 
as another, right? Um, and so there'd be an odd thing to say that, I don't know, a gay person who believes in the institution of marriage is no longer gay, right? We'd find that odd, wouldn't we, um, notionally? I hope. But if, <laughs> if, we, if we applied it to race, sometimes we give a lot more leeway for that kind of argument. We say, if you do not hold Proposition X to be true about how to deal with this particular form of discrimination, you are not black or you are not, you are betraying the group in some sense. And that's not necessarily the case by any measure. Sometimes people in a diverse community, um, even for minority communities, have differing opinions about how to solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to disagree. Um, and, you know, that's just it. Um, and I don't understand why beliefs then have to necessarily be criteria for group membership. So, yeah, that's one response to it. Um, and then the second response is, um, I, I, I struggle sometimes with this notion of, um, I think that's a claim to moral authority about lived experience, right? And generally, yes, I think that usually is true that if you've experienced a particular kind of event or a particular kind of injustice, that does give you insight of some kind, right? About um, all its various forms and the ways that it um, manifests itself. But it can't necessarily be translated into a question of moral authority, right? Um, so it isn't the case, and I think it was Ironically, I'm quoting Marx a lot today, but um, it was Marx who pointed out that there are certain social problems that are such that actually um, people who fall within, I think here he was talking about the proletariat, may not be best placed to diagnose the problem. This is where you come up with the theory of the vanguard of the proletariat, right? People who are not immediately in the coal face of the oppressions of capitalism on one end, removed and are sometimes able to better assess the problem. Now, that is not a claim to say that detachment necessarily vests some kind of objectivity per se. That's not it at all. Um, and it's also not the case that necessarily having been in the coal face of a particular injustice also vests any kind of authority other than the experiential kind, right? So you still have all your work ahead of you about arguments, about why this is good and its consequences, etc. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense or if that answers your question. No, I'm, I'm happy with your answer. Well, okay. <laughs> hey guys, at this point I am going to end this video as we move into the questions and answers uh, section. Uh, having received the course questions from the audience, I'm going to put that into a separate video and we'll call it part two. So catch the continuation of this video in part two.